Pastors, thank you. First Lady, thank you. Jennifer Maloof, thank you. And all my friends and family, and extended family out here, thank you. Before I start, I want you to understand and realize something about who you are. Who you are. You guys think you know who you are. But when I'm done talking to you tonight, you're going to know who you are. First of all, to know who God is, you need to know who he isn't. He isn't sickness. He isn't disease. He isn't lack. He isn't poverty. God is a good God. He's the one who said, all things are possible to those who believe. He didn't say some things. He didn't say if leap year was coming around. He said, all things are possible. All means all. Now, to know what God can do for you, you need to know what he can't do. He cannot work with a heart of unbelief. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says in the book of Romans that he calls an evil heart of unbelief. Now, I want you to understand, I'm your brother Sammy. I don't have the beautiful labels as pastors, but I'm your brother Sammy. And everywhere I go, signs, wonders, and miracles follow me. Because the Bible says, signs and wonders will follow those who believe. How many believers are here tonight? Each and every one of you are in covenant with God. It's greater than a promise. See, a promise always has a condition on something. You know, the conditions are fine. For you all to come here tonight, you had to put gas in your car, and there's a condition on that. You put gas in the car, the car brings you over here. Some of you may have an Uber. Some of you may have a friend. There's always a condition on that Promise. God always gives a condition. But in a covenant, there is no condition. There's no condition. Every single thing that's in this B-I-B-L-E belongs to you. Bible stands for best instructions before leaving this earth. Holy means he only loves you. Okay? So now remember something. I want you to tonight get the working knowledge of the word. Working knowledge. Knowledge isn't power. Information isn't power. If knowledge is power, why does my family feed thousands of people on Crocker and Fifth on a place called Skid Row? Those people have got degrees and diplomas that you can plaster all over these walls. But they're on Crocker and Fifth. They can't feed themselves. They have a lot of knowledge, but they don't have a lot of wisdom. Okay. Knowledge is always past tense and present tense. Wisdom is future tense. God always gives you the answer before the problem occurs. I want you all to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. In the book of Genesis, 1 verse 27, it says, God said he created male and female in his own image, the image of God. He created you identical to him. So let's figure out if daddy created us like him, don't you think we should be doing what daddy does? Okay, how did daddy create the universe? He spoke it. Did you notice the universe did not move? There was no light until God said, light be. And what happened? There was light. God said, peace be still. And what happened? Everything was still. He said, Lazarus come forth. And who came forth? Lazarus. Now God created you in his image. That means that you create your world 
and your environment with your words as well. God cannot do anything for you apart from faith no more than Satan could do anything to you apart from fear. Let me remind you one more time. Satan does not have power. Satan and God do not work together. Let me show you. When Satan was Lucifer in the heavens and God gave him a certain amount of authority. Certain amount. Satan thought he can exalt his throne higher than the throne of God and establish his ways. And God said, oh, no, you won't. So he threw Satan out of heaven. But he did more than that. When he threw Satan out, he stripped him from spiritual discernment and power. If Satan had power, he would have destroyed Adam 7,000 years ago. We already know he's not a god. He's a falling angel. Number one. Number two, I want you to get this in your understanding. God is not in charge. If God's in charge, he's doing a lousy job. Who did he leave in charge? He created Adam. He blew. Watch this. When he created Adam from the dust of the earth, it was the dirt. He created him. God had a blueprint. This beautiful blueprint of a man. But he created him from the dust. That means he formed him in the dust, in the dirt. And then he went. <laughs> when he did that, every organ, every artery, every vein, the blood, everything went through. The whole entire vision came to pass that quick. He says, Adam, I give you dominion over all this earth. He didn't give him the earth. He gave him dominion, authority. That means Adam has a right to say something. And God says, I back him up. So now, Adam gave this authority over to who? The enemy, Satan. Well, if Satan had so much power, why didn't he destroy Adam? Because he couldn't do it. He's not a god. He is a falling angel. God couldn't just go over and go bam and destroy Satan because it wasn't it wasn't his the, the, the stuff that Adam gave to him was the keys, the anointing of God. He gave it over to Adam. God knew he had to take it back. He couldn't just go destroy the enemy and take it back because it wasn't his to take back. If I give you my car and I give you the pink slip and I give you the keys, it's your car now. I can't tell you when to drive it, where to drive it, how to shift it. It's your car. It's your car. You can break it. When God gave Adam authority, he gave it to him. He knew that when he lost it, he had to get it back. So he couldn't create another Adam because when Adam sinned, he birthed sin throughout the whole earth. Everything was filthy now. It was polluted. So God said, okay, I'm not going to go against my word and take that power that Adam gave to Satan back. I can't touch the ground because it's filthy. I'm going to send myself. So he became in the beginning of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, who? God. In the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The 14th verse says, God became flesh and walked on this earth in a body called Christ. So he became the sperm. The fetus, the infant, the child, the teenager, and the, then the adult. And he walked on this earth the same way you're walking. No different. He walked on the earth, first of all, 
to demonstrate to all of us how to walk in power, how Adam was supposed to do it. How Adam was supposed to do it. Now listen up very carefully. When God walked on the earth, he spoke to the fig tree. He spoke to the lady with the issue of blood. He spoke to the wind and the sea. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised a little girl from the dead. The demon possessed person. He did deliverance on him. Did every event obey Jesus? Nothing obeyed Jesus. It obeyed his faith. Because if it obeyed God when he walked the earth, that means you would need him right here. She would need him. Everyone would need a, their own personal, physical God. That's how come he said in John 14, 12, if I live in you, the work I do, you will do also and greater. Now, folks, give yourself some credit here. Look at this building. Each and every one of you have got a craft. We're doing what Christ did on earth. We lay hands on the sick, they recover. We get them delivered and set free. They ask Jesus in their heart. They become saved. They have eternal life. But look, we're also got, each of us got talents. I'm a stunt man. I build race cars. I do stunts. That's my life. Building cars and doing stunts. The person who built this building, He's doing greater works than when God walked the earth. Air conditioning and heating, roofs over your head, carpet, concrete, cars to drive. God has made it so good for us. And he's given you the gifts and the talents, the vision, the calling and the purpose to walk on this earth and be the greatest example for him. So there's three things that I want you to get in your total understanding, number one, here's how you know your true identity. Your identity isn't in what daddy and mama says, or what the mirror says, or what your best friend said, or your worst friend said, or your husband said, or your wife said, or your girlfriend said, or your ex said. Your identity, number one, who you are in Christ. You need to know who you are in Christ. There's three ways that you're going to have victory or failure. Now, number one, let's find out first who you are in Christ, who daddy says you are. You're an ambassador for him. You're created in the image of him, for him. You were set apart unto holiness. That's what sanctified means. You are his prince and princesses. You are a general for him. Quit looking at yourself in the natural for a minute. Number one, who you are in Christ. Number two, how the enemy works. If you don't know how the enemy works, you're going to get your booty kicked every day. How does the enemy work? Tell me how he works in your life. Here's how he works. He works through the soul. Your soul is made of your mind, your will, and your emotions, your thoughts. Watch, it's not that you're not going to make it. It's the thought of you not making it. The past doesn't destroy the future. The thoughts of your past do. Everything in life is going to hinge on a thought. Every single thought comes with an image. Every image comes with an emotion. And every emotion causes you to act or react. Number one, Satan don't have power. He uses the power God gave you to work against you. He interjects a thought in your head. What does daddy say to do with the thought? You are to take every thought captive and cast down all imaginations or images that tries to exalt itself higher than you, your knowledge of the word. You're knowing God. Every thought, every thought. See, who you are in Christ, how the enemy works, and the third way is how to hear daddy's voice. See, God does not talk to you any way other than his word. 
He doesn't put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. God, can't, watch. You're going to answer this question yourself. Is there sickness in heaven? No. Then God can't give it to you. Is there poverty in heaven? Then God can't. He can't give you something that he doesn't have. He's a good God. He said every good and perfect, complete. The word perfect means complete. Every good and complete gift comes from him. So the enemy tries to trip you up because Satan don't have power. Only thing the enemy knows is your past and your presence. He does not know your future. So he starts bringing up your past. Anytime he brings up your past and you entertain, entertain the past, it becomes the present. If you internalize it again, you'll live it in your future. How do you know if you internalized yesterday? Because you start talking about it. What does God say death in life is? In the power of your tongue. Remember, God said like be. And it happened. Whatever you say with your mouth, you were going to have. And most of the time, people don't even remember what they say. They say things and they plant the seed with their mouth. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. How do you get something ripped up? First of all, you ask God to forgive you. You don't ask, don't say, I'm sorry. When you start saying, I'm sorry, what you're saying is, you, God said, I bore your sorrows. And I carried all your diseases. But when you say, I'm sorry, you're saying, I'm sorrow. You have what you say, the Bible says in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. So I want you, every time you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, that's right, because that's his phone number. He says, nobody goes to the Father unless they go through him, who is the Father. He's the Son, and he is the Holy Spirit. So when you go, Father, in the name of Jesus, he picks the phone up. He says, yes, what it is. And you tell him your request. He doesn't just come over and take over because he's giving you your own free will. So when they say, well, God's in charge. Well, tell me what's he in charge of. If God's in charge, why are you here? If God's in charge, why don't we just go do whatever we're going to do and say God's in charge. Your car got stolen. Well, God's in charge. The house got burned out. God's in charge. Why are we blaming God? God don't act that way. People say in their insurance policies, it was an act of God. The hurricane's coming. That's an act of God. No, it isn't. God don't act that way. God's not double-minded. He's not going to bless you today and curse you tomorrow. We got to straighten out the soul. That's your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's not your brain. We got to straighten out the conversations that are going over here and line this word up. See, this doesn't line up with your soul. Your soul better line up with this. So the first way that we can have victory or failure is our thoughts. God said, take no thought saying. Why did he say that? Because the only power a bad thought has is the conversation that you give it. The conversation you give it. Why? Because your words are seeds. You say it, it's going to happen. The moment you ask for forgiveness, God says, yes, I am faithful to forgive you. And then what? Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He says, forget the former days. What does that mean, forget? That means, I mean, we're not, we're not dummies. We can recall it. He says, I'm telling you, don't call, recall it. Choose not to recall it. He says, 
Never again will I remember a suffered wrong. That means everything you've ever done wrong in your life and everything you'll ever do wrong is covered under the blood of Jesus when he went to that cross. For you not to forgive yourself, it's a slap in Jesus' face saying what he did at the cross was a religious exercise and the blood didn't cover anything. You were covered as a matter of truth. If you bring your past up to God, he says, I don't remember that. And if you say, I'll never do it again, he'll say, do what again? Do what again? How many times are we supposed to forgive our brothers and sisters? 70 times 7 a day. A day. How many people can sin against you that much a day? No. You need to forgive yourself once in a while and settle it. Settle it. There's so many of God's little daughters, and I'm talking about all of you women here, that are carrying the lies and the burdens of yesterday that the enemy has cataloged inside of you, and you've allowed them to do it. There's so many of my brothers here that don't want to make another business deal or get in a relationship because of the last one. You can't do that. You can't do that. The mistakes you made yesterday, you're not going to make them today. You don't need to go through those experiences. God doesn't want you to have trial and error. He wants you to have trial and success. That's what this book is about. Look, the book of Psalms is what man says to God. The book of Proverbs is what God says to man. The Bible says a man with wisdom will see the problem and avoid it. That means God gives us the answer before the problem occurs. But if we're too busy here, too many conversations, too much going on, this voice that's here, sometimes you don't hear it. And then we make a bad judgment call. So the first way that we have victory or failure is your thoughts. The second way is your words. Remember, whatever is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. Whatever it is. Well, you know what? I can't do it. Wait a minute. The enemy doesn't care about any other word behind the words, I can't. He just wants you to say, I can't, I can't, I can't. Why? Because Philippians 4.13 says you can do all things. But God can only and he can't work any further than your words. You say things that are full of faith, God starts working. You say things that are full of fear, God stops. Fear is a spirit. What does the Bible say in Timothy? First Timothy what? 1 7. 2 Timothy 1 7. I did not give you the spirit, spirit, a spirit of fear, but I've given you power, love, and a sound mind. Fear is a spirit. All that nonsense that a lot of pulpits say. That look what God did to Job. That's a lie. In Job 1, all the way to, from 1, Job 1 to 5, 1, 1, 5. It talks about the burnt offerings. It talks about what Job did. It talked about what he owned in the land. And then he said, in Job 1, 5, he says, It may be my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. The next Verse says, this Job did regularly. Job would curse God daily. Job had so much anger and bitterness inside of him. But in front of the people, he was the most upright standing person. But what does God look at? The heart. How do I know that? Because Job 3, 1 says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job did. 
Well, where's death and life? In your tongue. And then Job 3.25, he said, For the things I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at peace, nor am I quiet, for trouble comes. Fear is a spirit. It leaves the body, possesses what you're afraid of, and brings it back. People get a bad report from a doctor, and most of the time the doctor's report is wrong. And they start worrying and meditating and speaking until the next thing you know it happens oh my god we're going through a big crisis you know hollywood is on strike i'm always the first to get laid off bam they get laid off why don't you keep your mouth shut god can only work but he can't work any further than your words now what is fear it's perverted faith fear is faith in the other direction people fear snakes because they have faith that the snake will bite them. God says in Hebrews 11.1. 1, what does it say in Hebrews 11.1? 1? Now faith is. When, in it, when is it? Now. God is always a now God. Now tense. When you pray and you say amen, it's done. Amen means it is done. So be it. Don't pray for it again. Water your seed. Thank him daily for it. But don't pray for it again. Don't pray for it again. If you pray the second time for the same thing you did the first time, God doesn't listen because that's a prayer of unbelief. He says, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. And you shall have it. You shall have it. I don't care what it looks like. You walk by faith and not by sight. You want to move God's hands, you move it through faith. Hebrews 11, 6, it's impossible to please me without faith. You must first believe. Believe what? That I am God, and I am a rewarder to those who diligently seek me. So believing in faith is two different things. So you're hungry, and I bring you a plate of food. You believe that that food would fill you up. But believing it alone, you'll starve. Faith is acting on what you believe. You pick it up. And you eat it. You pick it up and you eat it. When you pray for healing for your body. And you say amen. You act like you're healed. You thank him. Father I thank you. I am healed. Not going to be healed. I am healed. Why? Because when he said. When he told. Moses to take who? As his mouthpiece. Aaron. And what did he say? He said well who do we say? Sent us. He says, you say, I am sent you. What tense is I am right now? And he's right now with you. And he's right now wants to heal you. A lot of people I ask him, I go, do you believe that God can heal you? Yes, I do, Brother Sammy. Do you think he wants to? I don't know. See? They don't believe in themselves. They think because of the ugly things they've done in their past, that God's got a record of it. God does not have a record of your wrong. Let it go. Let your yesterday go. I want you to from now on to start focusing on what you go to in life and not what you go through. Yesterday has no right to come into today unless you keep dragging it. As the Bible says, bury the ax and let go of the handle. Let it go. You guys are worth more to God today than you were yesterday. So the first way that you can have victory or failure is your thoughts. The second way is our words. The third way is the people you associate with. I cannot emphasize this enough. Good people are good people, but they're not faith people. I have a tire. God speaks to me always through his word, but he speaks to me mechanically. My whole life I've been mechanically inclined. I don't care what it is. I can look at it and I can re-engineer it better than the engineer did it. So God speaks to me in mechanical terms. So if we have a tire and it's 50 inches tall and I have a tire that's 25 inches tall, I roll the 50 inch tall tire. One revolution. Let's just say for a conversation that rolls from here to the green curtain in the back. The 25 inch tall tire, it only rolls half the distance. In itself, by themselves, 
We can roll them all the way to Tootham Carry, South Africa. The big ones will get there first and the little ones will get there second. But now we roll them back and we put an axle between it. And it sits like this, the 25 inch, the 50 inch. And I roll it. As much as the big one wants to get ahead, that little one will spin it in a circle. You hook up with the wrong people in life. You will literally undermine, discount, ruin, and abort your future. You will live your life in a circle. How does the enemy work? He brings people in your life to entice you, promise to serve you. I promise to serve you. I promise. But he enslaves you. You go to him first because the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 6, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I'll direct your path. If you're hanging out with, I don't care who they are, they could be the nicest person in the world. But that does not mean it's husband material and that does not mean it's wife material. It does not mean it's boyfriend or girlfriend material. It does not mean it's business, women or men material. It does not mean it's ministry material. You acknowledge God. And don't you move till you know that you know. The worst thing to do is be faithful to the wrong thing in life. In every second. It's like a raindrop going in front of your eyes. You can't get it back. Time is one thing you can't get back. You notice time doesn't heal. If time heal, God's unnecessary. The only one that can heal your heart is God. Yes, Lord. God is showing me that there's so many people today that they have no peace and they cry out for peace. Listen to me. They go to bed at night. The room is dark. The TV's off. Everything around them is quiet. They're laying in bed. They got their covers up to their head. Their head's on the best pillow in the world. Everything around them is quiet. But their mind is screaming. There's a volcano going off. They can't go to bed, so they call it insomnia. No, there's no peace, folks. Peace is not the lack of conflict around you. Peace is the absence of conflict inside you. Peace means the war is over. The war in here. Let the Lord fill that up. Open that door that you never open there. This house has got a lot of rooms in it. There's one room in there that you keep walking by. And you don't open it. You don't open. You just keep walking by. And it's there. And God knows it's there. You're not supposed to open it by yourself. You and daddy open it together. He'll stand there. Remember, he says, behold, I knock at the heart, the door of your heart. Open the door with him. Let him go in there and purge out the very hurt that's there. Pastor, how much time do I have? How much time do I have? Let him open that door. I want, I want each and every one of you... For the, every, the way God wants. God wants every day of your life for the rest of your life to be the best of your life. How many are dealing with yesterday's pain? All we have to do is get rid of it. All we have to do, how many want to get rid of it right now? How many want to get rid of the pains? The hurts of yesterday. Okay. You're going to repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I boldly go to you. Your word says, if I ask you for forgiveness, you are faithful to forgive me. And then cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, I'm asking you now to rip up the garden of calamity the destruction that I've planted with my mouth and my actions the hurts that I took on and the people that I hurt forgive me now Lord and Father I expect what your word says you will give me peace right now 
that surpasses all understanding. Now let me do some confessions. Let me confess. Father, in the name of Jesus, your children have come to you right now and they've asked for forgiveness. And I thank you now that I, Father, on behalf of my brothers and sisters who are believers, I bind the spirit of fear, doubt, unbelief, unforgiveness, self-hatred, jealousy, oppression, depression, anger, resentment, and bitterness right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you now. It leaves their body now and goes to the pit of hell. Now, Father, I'm asking you as your children rest tonight. Rest. Rest. Father, you showed me 30 years ago. You can sleep for 20 hours and wake up exhausted. You can rest for four hours and wake up energized. Well, Father, they're going to rest tonight because they cast these cares upon you. And you said, Father, lay them down at the cross. And they will not pick them up again. From this day forward, they will never look back. They will start where they want to be in life and not where they're at. They will focus on what they go to and not what they've gone through. And Father, as you showed me, the greatest exercise for our heart is to reach out and lift others up. It's a sign of a believer that we love one another. And Father, you said to walk in love. Walk in love. Well, I'm giving you the praise, glory, and honor tonight, Father, for my precious, beautiful brothers and sisters. And from this day forward, Father, as they say, Father, in the name of Jesus, look, 777 is the streets of gold. 666 is the pit of hell. You figure out the phone number. Because the address that you go to, you want to make sure their streets are gold. The other address, oh, there'll be gold, all right, but there'll be flames. You don't want to be there. So, Father, I'm asking you for me to wrap your loving arms around every person's heart right now. Hold them tight to you. And speak into their ears and tell them they are forgiven and you love them. I'm giving you the praise, glory, and honor for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 You know, I, got, I want to tell you a quick testimony. On a movie, Fast and Furious 2, I was driving the Corvette that was never supposed to flip. So if you ever watch that movie, you'll see that Too Fast, Too Furious, an 18-wheeler runs over a Mustang. Now, we did this in cuts. An 18-wheeler runs over the Mustang, throws it out the back, and I come in in a convertible Corvette and hit the Mustang as I was supposed to. But remember, we have the best drivers in the business and the best stunt coordinator and second unit director in the business right there. And they all ruled out. They ruled out that the car would not get upside down. But I didn't rule out God. Because God said, in all my ways acknowledge him. I'm a Christian big time. I have so much fun, but I'm a Christian. So I prayed and God said, do not use the harness belts. Now in racing, in cars that have roll bars, we put harness belts on. When they don't have a roll bar in it, and we're gonna do chase scenes, I only use a lap belt that's real loose because I have a strap on the floor. If the car starts to get upside down, I dive to the floor, grab the strap, and I pull myself under the dash because the rule of thumb to me is the car's not gonna crush any lower than the dashboard. So I'm gonna get my body under that dash. Yeah, it's gonna hurt and I'm gonna get banged up, but I'm gonna walk away from that. So on that day, I couldn't do that because the 2002 Corvette had a console right here and it had a camera right here. So I'm, I sat in the car, I adjusted myself, I put 
knee pads on and one elbow pad. I wasn't figuring the car's going to get upside down, but I did not rule out God. He told me, I prayed a week ahead of time what I'm supposed to do. And on the day, he says, don't use harness belts. And then, that was the first thing he told me. And then he used, remember he says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, that each would be established. The guy that was driving the AT really goes, here, Sammy, I brought you a grab strap. A grab strap is good. You wrap it around your bicep, you wrap it to the floor, and you go to the ground. But I had a camera here. And I have a console that can't get over. But God told me this. He says, go put angels around your car. So I walked around that car. I says, angels, I want one at this corner, one at that corner, one at this corner, one at this corner, and one at the driver door. And I said, no matter what goes right or wrong in this stunt, Sammy Maloof is not supposed to be hurt. And I'm Sammy Maloof. I made my angels know who I was. They said action. The car took off. Within 30 feet, I could not see anything because the special effects was coming through the window and hit me in the face. But I, I can't stop. I got 40 cars behind me. And there was somebody on the radio already going, Terry, we can't see. Sammy can't see. But he didn't get the message. Our second unit director did not get the message. Why? Because Satan is known as the father of the air. And he interrupted that message. So I'm still going 25, 35, 45, 55, 55 miles an hour. I hear Sammy Maloof, we're doing 55. I put the camera on. The next thing I'm supposed to hear is we're releasing the Mustang from the truck. The Mustang that got runs over, kicks it back. I'm supposed to hit it. I don't hear that. I don't hear them say I'm releasing it. 55, 65, all of a sudden I hear, boom, the car releases off the truck. They got cable cutters. Now I'm going, where's the car? Where's the a bunch of white special effects? 55, 65, 75, I see a piece of red and I throttle the car. I hit that car and my Corvette went straight up in the air and hit the ground at 80 miles an hour upside down and crushed to the ground. And not one hair was touched on my head. But God said, not Sammy, this book said no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And no evil will befall me. The enemy shall rise against you one way and flee seven. I don't take my testimonies lightly. I've got thousands of testimonies. You should have them too. Faith God, pull on him, involve him. He says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. I don't care if it's breakfast time. He's going to have breakfast with me. You guys know who you are. You've got more power in you than you think. Your faith is greater than the thoughts of your faith. Use it, you guys. I love you. Father, I thank you for your word today. Pastor, I thank you for allowing me to speak. If you have any questions at all, I'll be around. Feel free to ask. Come on up, Pastor. Ready? Thank you so much. I love this man. Thank you, Sammy. That was so powerful.